Hi, I'm Chris Roselli. And I'm Anna Magidson. Welcome to Western Window, a show made for you by students at Western Washington University. This time on Western Window, we'll find out more about the new conductor of the WWU Symphony Orchestra. We'll watch some of the wizards at Western work their magic. We'll learn about how the Salish Sea got its name, and we'll check out a popular celebration on campus. So stay with us as we explore our world through Western Window. Western Washington University opened a new downtown office on June 19th in Bellingham's Historic Herald Building. The new office, which is located in the building that houses the Bellingham Herald Daily newspaper, will help better connect the WW Alumni Association and the WW Foundation with the entire local community, as well as alumni and Bellingham-based businesses and philanthropists. developing downtown Bellingham and we're so excited that Western Washington University has chosen and I say chose because they didn't have to do this create a presence here in the in the historic Herald building that will give a face to Western in the downtown this space opened up with the Herald moving up to the second floor it I think it made an obvious uh, decision for them. It's got a lot of exposure and you know there's over 15,000 alumni that live in Whatcom County so this is a great place to reach out and uh, a common question that I get uh, owning property and working downtown is where is Western located? Now we're not going to have that problem anymore. I think that the exposure here is uh, tremendous. I mean the traffic count and the foot traffic I mean we're really um, pleased to have them and the space that they decided to move into, I think uh, it's meeting its potential. I mean, it's an iconic building in Bellingham, I mean the Herald Building, it's one of the first buildings that come to mind, you know, when people think of downtown Bellingham. I love that, you know, it's old, it's got the high ceilings, the big windows, it just, you know, it's got a lot of character. Um, I like the idea of, you know, continuing to use old buildings and not getting rid of them, so hopefully this will help revitalize the space. and and uh, keep it here for years to come. So hopefully we can be a little part of that. My dad was the sports editor of the Bellingham Herald for 48 years, and his office was in this building over on the other side. So one of the reasons I came today is because I was kind of curious about the building and what it looks like. I haven't been in it for a long time. I think it's great that Western's going to be a presence downtown. And uh, of course, Chris uh, Roselli is a good, and his family are good friends of ours, so it'll be nice for him to be down here too. I think having the presence downtown is a good idea, I really do. Well, I think it's important to everyone in Bellingham because people have uh, often regarded Western as its own entity on the hill, and for them to actually bring an office downtown, it says a lot about how much they actually want to be involved in our community, and I think having a, having a place where people can come downtown connects the hill and Western to the rest of the community, so I, I think it's awesome and very significant. So Whatcom is our second largest concentration of alumni and we have a lot of alums that want to engage with Western but going up and trying to park is just a little difficult. So we're coming to them and uh, mostly alumni staff is going to move into the space but we're going to have a kiosk where folks can come and sign up for a tour of campus or they can buy tickets for athletic events or performances and we're going to just have a lot of those materials. Not to mention we're going to be intentional about moving out into the community and really engaging and partnering with as many businesses and alumni as we can. You know Western when it comes in session uh, increases the population of Bellingham by almost 20 percent. 
I've had the opportunity to work with the leadership at Western for the last three years as county executive and eight years as mayor of Linden, and they really, you know, they're out in the community, but our visitors coming through town wouldn't necessarily know we're a, we're a college town if, uh, if they didn't know it. So to have this presence down here so that people will have the opportunity and the, the visual cues that we have a lot going on. Our President Bruce, he one of his great quotes that he says is that communities support, support universities that support communities. And one in eight Bellinghamsters is a Western alum. It's the second largest population of alumni outside of King County, where Seattle is, of course. We have so, over 14,000 alumni in Whatcom County. And so to be able to be downtown, to be a part of the downtown Bellingham partnership, to be a part of the community here in Bellingham, to be accessible down here um, is really exciting. It's really great to be able to be downtown and be a part of the Bellingham community. Dr. Ryan Dudenbostel is the new director of orchestral studies right here at Western Washington University. He conducts the WWU Symphony Orchestra and teaches courses in conducting and music theory. He's performed around the world, worked in New York and Los Angeles, is an accomplished clarinetist, and was among fewer than a dozen Americans invited to participate in the 11th International Conducting Competition in Barcelona. And he's bringing his passion for music back to the place where he got his start. Dudenbostel is a Western Washington University alum. What's it like to conduct an orchestra? I'm almost afraid to tell you because if I, if I tell you how much fun it is, then everybody will want to become a conductor. Conducting is a gestural language that communicates uh, specific information to a group of musicians. So I'm showing how fast we're going, I'm showing um, how loud, how soft, um, this needs to be a little louder, this should be a little softer, so balancing things, and also um, what we call articulation, uh, how short, how long, um, whether something should be pressed a little harder, or whether something should be kind of softened out. So the conductor's job really is to come up with one interpretation and get everybody on board so that they're all making the same piece in the same way. It's really magical. Um, and especially in performance um, with a good orchestra who's flexible, when, if you want to try something new and they go with you and you never talked about it, it's just a, you, you moved a little bit in this way and they moved in that way. Um, it's really quite special that the depth of that connection when no words are, exch are exchanged. I started at 15, yeah. I really had no idea what I was doing. But you know, when you're, when you're that age, things don't seem hard, even though they really are. And so I'm grateful actually to have kind of cut my teeth when I didn't have the fear of failure as much. Got involved conducting here. Uh, I had a very supportive teacher, David Wallace, who's now retired, gave me a lot of uh, really unusual opportunities for an undergraduate and then I went from there to graduate school at the Kansas City Conservatory and then to my doctorate at UCLA. I conduct the University Symphony Orchestra, which is a full symphony, um, 80 members uh, from across the campus community, about half of whom are music majors and the other half represent all the different uh, colleges and departments of Western. I find music absolutely fascinating um, for a few reasons. Um, number one, what we get as classical musicians from composers is a very sophisticated system of notation uh, that still leaves a lot up to the interpreter to figure out. So um, uh, a piece of music is essentially a recipe and there's a lot in the recipe that's assumed and I love that meeting of the, the concrete sophisticated notation and what the interpreter, the artist, has to uh, backfill. I think what we've done here at Western uh, in this year is, is something that I, I really will cherish. Um, the students are wonderful 
and hardworking and curious uh, and game really to do anything, um, which is very exciting as a conductor. That's a great question. Are all eyes on me if the orchestra's playing? Well, it's sort of like um, they, they watch, they have to be reading the music. Um, and they occasionally, if they're playing a long note, they can look up from the note and then look back, back down at it. But most of the communication is through peripheral vision. So they can see the motion, even though they're not looking at me directly, um, they can still keep track of where I'm at with the motion. There are always little adjustments all the time. And you, you train an orchestra to be sensitive to that by uh, doing it in rehearsal. I think orchestral music is fantastic and exciting and fascinating and interesting and completely accessible um, to people who know a lot about music or don't know anything about music. When you have 80 people on stage, uh, you know, going for it 100%, playing like as loudly as possible or as softly as possible, there's something really gripping about that. It's like, because we, we're conductors, we don't actually make sound, which is the odd thing, being a musician. We just, we move through the air and we communicate how we want sounds to be. But it almost is like the sound becomes tangible if the orchestra is really responsive. And you can, you can draw a line through the air and it's almost like you're, you're moving something or you're moving through fluid or you can see the trace behind it in the sound. And that's a really magical, surreal thing. In early 2011, the governments in the United States and Canada welcomed the name Salish Sea as the umbrella name for the Strait of Georgia, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the Puget Sound. Western Washington University Professor Emeritus Burt Weber is credited with proposing the name change and in the process helping residents gain a more complete understanding of this precious resource. Everybody knows the Strait of Juan de Fuca, Georgia Strait in uh, British Columbia, and Puget Sound. It's been thousands of years that uh, humans have lived around the boundaries of the Salish Sea, but only until 1990, uh, the 1990s that it was recognized as a distinct entity. There is a strong scientific reason for the Salish Sea. It's a, a very well-defined estuary ecosystem that connects together the waters of Georgia Strait, Puget Sound, and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So uh, it is a distinct entity. What's even more interesting in my mind is how the name has become popular. Uh, not everybody knows where it is yet, but uh, if you start looking at how the Salish Sea name is being used, there's no question that it is here to stay. And so that means it's also serving some need that people have about this place that uh, we all live in. The Salish Sea name, I think, has its roots uh, in the oil transportation uh, uh, industry. When oil was discovered in Alaska and was going to come into the inland waters of, uh, this, of what is now the Salish Sea, people recognized and started to look at what was at stake? What would we lose if there was an oil spill? And it became clear as that kind of science was done that there was an ecosystem. And that was the ecosystem that uh, said, yes, this is a entity that should be acknowledged. I had the incredible luck to uh, think about the name and uh, offer it at a time that there was a reception for it. And I'm a biologist by background, and that's what biologists do. If there's something there, you name it. But that's actually a human trait. If there's something that we want to learn about, and there's something that we're interested in, it's very difficult to proceed very far if it doesn't have a name. I guess in that way, uh, the credit for planting the seed uh, belongs to me. But as I've said to many people, if the Salish Sea is going to be something that is valuable and something that is useful, it has to be accepted and promoted by everybody. It uh, involved people in Canada as well as the United States and people in, from 
the Canadian First Nations and the, the Salish tribes in the state of Washington, uh, all of whom found uh, a excitement about the possibility of it becoming a name. So without that groundswell of uh, support from across the border, uh, the name never would have gotten accepted. Uh, Western is thinking now strongly of starting an academic program that focuses on the Sealy Sea. One of its uh, stable, if we can call it that, of uh, alternative education approaches to try to bring some greater degree of uh, relevancy to students' programs. So hopefully in the next uh, five years or so we will see a Sealy Sea program that will actively involve the faculty not only in research but also in understanding, for uh, continuing to understand the, the sense of place and how important that is. The people who live around it, the seven million people that are on the shorelines of the Salish Sea, find a value in that name, in connecting to the place that they live. It's more than just living on the Puget Sound, it's that I'm living on the Salish Sea and I have connections with people who live up in Georgia Strait and down and throughout uh, the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The world around us is made entirely of matter, commonly grouped together as solids, liquids, and gases. In a series of dramatic demonstrations, Professor Betsy Raymond, assisted by students from Western Washington University's Chemistry Club, got the chance to show visiting children and their parents just how exciting it can be when matter changes form. So I'm Betsy Raymond and I'm faculty in the Chemistry Department and I'm co-advisor of the Chemistry Club and recently did the Wizards of Western demonstration show for kind of middle school aged kids and the topic was what's the matter and looking at phases of matter and how they go from one phase to another. So looking at solids going to liquids, solids going to gases, liquids going to gases, and some in kind of a dramatic fashion. My favorite one of the new ones was the sublimation of iodine. So iodine crystals are kind of a silvery gray color and they're really shiny, which is interesting because it looks like it's a metal, though they're not. And so you actually see the crystals growing and we had some really nice kind of inch to two inch long spires that were really cool. And we also did elephant toothpaste. So hydrogen peroxide naturally decomposes from hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. And that happens pretty slowly on kind of an everyday basis. If you let hydrogen peroxide sit there, you might see a few bubbles now and again, but not very many. And so we actually sped that up by adding a catalyst. So we added potassium iodide, which causes that reaction to happen much faster. And to visualize that, to actually see the gas being produced, we added a whole bunch of soap and so it produced this cascading, just giant volumes of foam. Made a cloud by pouring hot water into liquid nitrogen and the gas actually expands so rapidly you get some thunder in the room. You have this very, very hot water coming in contact with the liquid nitrogen, which the water, while not hot enough to burn you if you put your hand in it, was screaming hot to the liquid nitrogen just because it's so cold. Between Steve and I, we generally think up most of the demos, although we actually did a meeting earlier this year where we encouraged the students to go out on the internet and find a bunch of demos that looked cool to them. And so one of our meetings, we watched probably 30 YouTube videos and looked for different demos. And actually that's what reminded me of the elephant toothpaste demo and actually the iodine sublimation as well. Some of the ideas are faculty driven, but a lot of them are student driven um, and they help us to organize the show. But as you saw during the show, they really did most of the hands-on doing. I was doing a lot of the instructing of, okay, this is what you need to do now, but they were doing most of the doing. 
This was my second Wizards of Western. I have done some other demo shows through Chem Club. This was my third time total trying to do the dumping the hot water into the liquid nitrogen. And it was by far the best that I've ever done. And that's not all me. I mean, I dump the hot water in. I don't really do much else. But it was really cool to see it really be a blast for everyone who is there and to see everyone react to it and to have everything go as planned and to have it be as safe and successful as it was. The topics were different. Last year we did um, one that was water-based and this one was more, it wasn't just water. <laughs> I really like doing it because um, I think it's cool to like show little kids about chemistry as well. I feel like children really, they like science and everything, but chemistry isn't something that they think of as much as like biology and stuff like that. So it's cool to show it to them. <laughs> I honestly don't remember. I suspect it's been all four years that I've been here I've done it, uh, but there's so many demo shows that we put on and I try to sign up for as many of them as possible. It's the time we finally actually get to reach out to other people who aren't at Western, uh, specifically children. And uh, since they're the ones who are going to be coming up and want to get interested in coming to college and possibly even doing chemistry, this is really the time to, to get them involved. And like I had that experience when I was a kid and that's really what got me motivated into science. And so it's nice to give back to the same way. I really love sharing kind of my enthusiasm and love for science with other people, particularly with kids. They're so curious about the world around them. And at some point in time, that curiosity just seems to go away. And so to encourage that curiosity and encourage them to keep asking questions and showing them cool things, that maybe some of which they can reproduce at home, but to keep them asking questions, this is really important because that's really what science is. It's about finding the answers, but really it's about asking the questions first. And you've got to keep doing that and keep those skills in practice. So you're telling me you want to be a filmmaker? Well, welcome to film school! What is the recruit's name? Vince Hotel, sir! Where are you from? I'm from Seattle, sir! Only hipsters and coffee drinkers come from there! Which are you, boy? I don't know, sir! Get down, give me 50! So, the 48 Hour Film Festival is a film festival that KVIKE hosts um, every year. I think we've been doing it for the last five years. Um, and it's a good opportunity for student filmmakers to show what they've got and it's a really fun time and you just get to make a film within 48 hours with a few other people. This year there were six teams total um, but unfortunately one of them couldn't get their films done on time so they got dropped out of the competition but there were still five really awesome films. But every year there is a specific line of dialogue. They're trying to communicate with us. A, a specific character and also a specific prop that each team needs to include. Um, and then each team is also assigned a specific genre that they need to work within. There was a action comedy, zombie, a mockumentary, a monster movie, a superhero. So I'm Don Dietrich and I'm a professor in the English department and the director of Western Reads. Well, I've been connected with that festival, I think for about five years now, and I've participated in it mostly as a judge. Um, but a lot of the students have often had classes with me, so a lot of times they'll, we'll have conversations about their films after the festival is over, so it's kind of an ongoing discussion for me with them. There were four top prizes. The first prize team got uh, some tickets to Nifty, um, and that was the film Rob Dot Ot, which was the action comedy. Um, then second place team was the zombie movie, um, and they got some tickets to the Pickford and some t-shirts as well. And then there was an honorable mention and an audience choice, which both went to The King of Clubs, which was the mockumentary film. Um, and then there were five other categories. The best prop was the big golden flamingo used in the superhero movie. Um, the best dialogue exchange was the opening scene from uh, the zombie movie. The best one-liner was the Night Night Club from the King of Clubs movie. Um, the best character was the detective from the monster movie. And then 
the best costume ones to one of the robots in Rob Dot. This year's festival was awesome. Whenever you have an event that students organize and put together and where there's standing room only, be there. It's the best party in town. And that's how the 48 hour film festival is every single year. The students love it. The students who self-select to do this are really passionate about their films and I've been amazed pretty much every year by how awesome the films are. Really impressive quality, unbelievable for 48 hours. And they love seeing an audience see their work. Nothing replaces that. So yeah, it's just a great opportunity for students to learn. I thought the festival was uh, pretty successful this year. We didn't really have any technical difficulties at the event. And yeah, we got to host it at the Pickford this year, which was a really nice uh, theater to have our event in and it filled up the, the, big, the bigger theater in the Pickford. Um, I guess the only downside about having it at the Pickford is that it's not on campus and not as readily available for students in dorms, but still the Pickford's like a pretty close trip. Uh, I thought it went good, yeah. Uh, a lot of the teams sh showed like really good um, skills and yeah, I was pleased with all of the stories and all of the creativity behind every team and I thought that a lot of, all of the films were of really good quality and yeah. Take the leap. Put your name out there. Even if you don't know other people who are doing it, there, there are always people looking for teammates and I would say I don't know anybody who has tried it for the first time who didn't want to come back and do it again. That's it for this episode of Western Window. We'll see you next time as we explore our world at and around Western Washington University. Western Window is proud to partner with the following student publications. Clipson Magazine is published twice each quarter and includes features, multimedia, and issues that affect lives across the greater Bellingham area. You can find it online at clipsonmagazine.com. The Western Front is the official newspaper of Western Washington University, published by the Student Publications Council and funded by your advertising dollars. The Western Front. Get it first, get it right, at westernfrontonline.net. The Planet is Western Washington University's award-winning quarterly environmental publication and the only undergraduate environmental magazine in the United States. Explore the Planet online at planet.wwu.edu.